my life has been defined by three words. For most of the people, they have a plan. You know, you kind of say, I want to be this, by this age I need to be this, etc. I never had a plan. My life is defined by three words. Access, authenticity, and ask. So what I'll do is today I'll go through with you what do I do when, you know, things go crazy? And they go crazy every day, every year, all my life. So I worked, my, my career started with Intel. And I went to Intel again, I told you, no plan. I was just somewhere, I needed a job. And someone said, go talk to them. I went and talked to them. I just needed money. I needed a green card. I thought I will work and save enough money and go to LA and be an actress. That was my dream. And uh, so I went there, completely fell in love with technology. And it was in 1988, when Intel was not even, uh, you know, two, it was a $2 billion company. And it was so heady, it was so much fun, because there weren't any boundaries to what we could do. And this is where, and I was very clear, I told them I'm the only non-engineer in the entire group. And, uh, and I was in finance, moved to marketing, etc. But the biggest lesson I learned there was you have to ask for what you want. And I just went to somebody, I would create my job. I did eight different jobs at Intel. Not one of them was a published job. I would just create myself a job. I would see a new technology that's coming up and I would say, I want to be there. And I would go sell it to the person running it as to why they need to hire me. And um, and I've had the most amazing, amazing jobs. And everything we worked on in 91, 92, 95, 96 are a reality today. And so the biggest lesson I learned from it is that when we were working on it, it was so chaotic. Nobody understood what we were talking about. In 91, when we said laptops will come, mobile technology, and all these things. In 92, when we talked about digital content. In 94, when we talked about e-commerce let alone outside, inside the company it was chaotic. They were like, we don't know what this means, you know, we don't, do, uh, how much money do we allocate to this? Does it, will it ever become a reality, you know? So you had to always paint the 30,000 foot level picture and say that in 94 we were saying e-commerce will become a reality. So Andy Grove would say, it's like a wild, wild west. What does this mean? And we would get thrown out of the boardroom all the time as to we don't want to allocate any money to this. But we had to paint a picture. We created four different demos at that time to show what the future of shopping would be without having anything in place. We said, this is how you'd go into a shop. This is how you would shop. This is how it would show all the information. You put in a menu, the ingredients come, and this is how you would shop. We had to think of what people would do with technology and create the scenario and bring it back. So the first lesson I learned in my time with Intel is that when you're talking about something very, very futuristic, the only way they understand is you have to tell a story. You have to tell a story of what the future is going to look like, where this technology is being used. Nobody cares about how many bits or bytes or, uh, you know, how long will it take to crack this code or whatever. We had to show the story. So the first thing I learned is how to keep telling these interesting stories. This is how you'll buy tickets. And imagine if you're sitting somewhere, you look at the ticket number and you say, from this, there is actually a pole, so I cannot see the ground very well, so I'll buy my ticket here, so I can see how the ground looks like. Say, ha, ah, now I get it, why you need online ticketing, you know? So that's the first thing about chaos, is that first of all, I, I learned that I have to accept that when you do something new, it will be chaotic. And this is the one mantra Andy taught us, is that he said, change is the only constant in life. You want to stay ahead, you have to keep changing. Changing yourself, changing your business. This is a company that was at the peak of their success as a DRAM business. The CEO and uh, Andy walked out of the door, came back in and shut down the business. Imagine your number one business saying I'm going to shut it down because I'm going to reinvent myself. So that's the first thing is accepting chaos and then always looking up at the top and saying where are we going. So that's the first thing I learned. Second thing, you know, after being at Intel for a long time, I went off to 
American India Foundation. I said, I want to bring a change in India through philanthropy and all that stuff. And I realized that Indians are not philanthropic by nature in the way the West defines philanthropy. The way the West defines philanthropy is about giving to a common cause and then that being run professionally. We do philanthropy in our backyard. We take care of our maid's child's education, we take care of our village education, you take care of whatever. But it is important for us to do both. It's important for us to take care of our own neighborhood, but it's also important for us to be collective so that we can achieve huge results. So we spent five years on how do you make someone feel good about giving. So it's a whole science of understanding what it makes you feel like when you give. And how do you create a great experience? How do we show you what have you done in the world out there and make you feel good to give? How do you combine glamour and philanthropy and fun to raise money? We raised almost $30 million in five years by our learning of how to do this. And uh, it's really great to do, you know, the effect it has out there. So that's the second thing of how understanding how to make people feel good about making them do what you want them to do. It's not for you, it's not for them, it's for a larger thing. But how do you make people feel great about giving? Create a great experience for them. Now, the final thing is truly about when you start your own journey, you know, at Intel, I had the Intel stamp. Of course, in those days, Intel was like Google, Facebook, and everything combined, and anybody answered your call. So you have the Intel stamp. Then when you go to American India Foundation, uh, you have the foundation stamp, that some of the richest people are there, and so you're kind of being in their shadow. Now, when you start something on your own, you're completely hanging out there on your own. It's a true test of who are really my circle, you know? And it's the toughest journey. And I say this to all the entrepreneurs, that entrepreneurship is not about glamour at all. You know, when somebody gets funded, that's when you hear about them. But really, the work happens 10 years before that or eight years before that. All the hard work that happens to get there. So I want to share a little bit of what I learned here is that, first of all, you need to look at success only in 10-year intervals. We always look at quarters and years, etc. But if you really want to look at your own success or the stamp you're making, you've got to look at 10-year intervals. So for me, when I looked at, and I started, I, was, I got, became an entrepreneur in my 40s. So it's like by then, for most of the entrepreneurs today, you should be at home. They call you auntie. It's putting you in your place saying, you sit at home and do good stuff, but don't come out and be the cool chick, you know. So that's the toughest thing is to break all the you know uh, norms of what are you supposed to be right and so when i started inc you know even today it's like seven years everybody says oh she brought ted to india but all the work we do for seven years and everything else no one remembers and you have to accept that you have to say that hey how do i learn from somebody instead of being upset about it so i just want to share a couple of uh, things that i have in the last journey I have learned is that, first of all, life has so far been about external journey. It's still to me about I want to travel all over the world, find the most amazing people, connect them to each other. I'm like a eternal matchmaker. You know, I get very excited when I introduce two people to each other and something comes out of what they're doing and I totally take credit for it, even though they don't know, nobody else knows. And, but there are two things that happened that really opened my eyes to the power of storytelling and the power of the audience. The first one is when we decided to do TED in India. Um, we had, I, you know, I just did it only because I wanted 30, 40 Indian stories on TED and that was it. So one of the people we had there is a woman called Sunita Krishnan. Um, how many of you know her? Sunita, well, it's Hyderabad, so a lot of you know her. She rescues women out of prostitution and brings them home, and we curated her talk, and I said, give the toughest talk you can, because this is a big problem. I mean, let's not make it nice, let's not make it, you know, and it is, and she gave one of the most gut-wrenching talks about 
the statistics and what happens, including photographs of women, you know, girls being raped at the age of five, women being tied to a bed for 10 years, being raped by 30 to 40 men every day, and the kind of, the people she rescues, the rescue missions she goes on. At the end of it, it was just one of the toughest talks. And I asked her, what is the one thing you wish you could have? And she said, I wish I had a permanent home because we rescue all these women, we bring them, and nobody wants us in their neighborhood. Everybody wants us out. So I wish I had a permanent home. And her storytelling was so powerful, people just got up and said, I will give money to get the permanent home. Now the biggest lesson I learned is that we feel good, we promise things, we go home and life happens. We forget about all the things that has happened, the promises we made, so we actually took the names of all the people who promised to give. And it took us one year to follow up with them, collect the money, and then talk to companies. And we collected enough money for her. So 18 months from the time she gave a talk on the stage, she has a 10-acre campus outside Hyderabad where all the women live together. And they, have their, they grow their own vegetables, they have an amphitheater. And that's what opened my eyes to a powerful story combined with action. We can truly change the world one story at a time. So that's what our journey has been for the last seven years as to, it's, it, how, first of all, how to teach people how to tell their story well. There are so many people who do great work but don't know how to tell their story. How do you teach them how to tell their story? And secondly, how do you make them famous? You know, you ask any of our children, their role models are somebody who lives somewhere else. If one more kid says Elon Musk, I want to shoot myself, you know? I mean, he's great, but come on, we have a lot of people here as well. So how can we create heroes out of the people we have here? The only way we can do it is by making them successful. So the second story that opened my eyes to is, you all must have heard of Arunachalam. You know, he's a man who um, created low-cost sanitary napkins and uh, worked with women. He's been doing his work when we discovered him. It's not like we gave him the idea or anything of that sort. But in 2010, when we found him, and I told him, you must give your talk in English, and you must give your talk in less than 10 minutes so people remember you. And he was like, no, 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 I don't know English, all that stuff, but we convinced him and we taught him how to give his talk in nine minutes, okay? His whole life's journey in nine minutes. That talk went viral and he became the time man of the year and blah, blah, all kinds of things. His machines have been sold. Now there are four or five other companies that have started with the same idea. And there was a recently a movie made about him by Akshay Kumar, Padman. And we have seen him actually have a meteoric rise just by teaching him how to tell his story in 10 minutes or less. So the point is, it's not that we made him. He's already there. He's already fantastic. And all we need to do is choose a person and have a certain ego and say, will this person's life change because they met me? And we tell each of our community members that pick one person like that. Did that person's life change because of you? And can you make sure that person remains the good person he is or she is? Because what also happens when you have success, it goes to your head. Now you think your heart shed and now you don't remember where you came from. Can you keep them grounded? So this is the final point of my journey is for the last seven years, we've done various things. We did large conferences, small conferences, corporate programs, high school programs. You know, we've been in, you know, 500, 900 high schools, 30 colleges, various things. And after all this, I came back to an understanding that it's a small group of people that really will change the world. So what if we bring this small group of people together and help make them successful? And will we become successful through their success? So that's the new journey. I'm on. And in this, uh, there are, and I'm really fascinated by the source of our thinking. Like if I'm angry about something, if I'm jealous about someone, um, if I feel like, you know, strangling somebody, where is the source of it coming from? 
So there is a lot we can learn from our evolutionary biology, understanding our own brain, how, how we operate, to understand the source of these things. So it's through stories we learn how to deal with the world. And then it's by journey inside is we learn how to use ourselves as an instrument in moving forward. So, you know, like human, I mean, I'll give you a small uh, example. We have an Inc. Fellowship program. We pick like 20 amazing people, young people every year. We bring them together. And I learned so much from them. So a couple of our uh, fellows are scientists there at National Center for Biological Sciences. So they said something very interesting. They said human brain has about 80 billion plus neurons. And these are her exact words. She says, um, we cannot locate an object as quickly and effortlessly as a mosquito can find a human being. And the mosquito has only 100,000 neurons in its head. So it's, you know, we are not even as smart as a mosquito in the way we are using the data that we have in our heads. So it's not just about having access to information, having access to data, but it's how to use it, how to make it successful, how to make it effective. So all my life has been about collecting people, but I haven't thought much about how to make the network network. I haven't thought much about how to make this network be a huge force out there. And that's the journey that fascinates me now, is that can, with, with our 80 billion neurons, if we can be as good as a mosquito, and if each person we have in our network can zone in on one thing and find that human body, not to bite, but to maybe do something good, can we have a better world? And everything that excites me is long term. It's like a 100 year plan excites me or a 30 year plan excites me. So the biggest journey I had to make within myself is to understand that I may not be around to see the success. I may not even get credit for that success. I may not even know if I myself will be successful or not. But as long as I surround myself with the right people, will the journey keep moving forward. And in this, what I learned is also about not to deny our imperfections. We have to accept that we are imperfect. I mean, it's not about, we talked about managing chaos with composure. It's not like the idea is to be like this all the time. You'll be like the most boring person ever. You know, the key is you will have elation. You will have depression. Do you know how to pull yourself down or up so that you can maintain the composure faster and faster. So, you know, when my first breakup happened, I thought, oh my God, that's it. I'm going to be like female version of Devdas. I will never see another human being in my life. I am dedicated to my work, blah, 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 all these things. Guess what? Two weeks later, another cute guy walks by. I'm like, hmm, that's interesting. And I thought, I'm a bad woman because I'm finding somebody else interesting. I'm supposed to be this you know, person dedicated to one man. This is all the bullshit they teach you when you grow up here. So, but life's about constantly reinventing yourself. Saying that didn't work, throw it out. How can the next thing come up? And how quickly can you get over? And how quickly can you make sure you stay grounded? You know, a great success comes, somebody writes an article about you, you're like, oh, I'm great. But how quickly do you bring yourself back? So that's the main lesson I learned about success is that, or to maintain composure, is to accept that you will never ever be flat all the time. You'll be up and down, up and down, up and down, and enjoy that and let the world see it. I don't want my son to think that mom and dad never fight, nor do I want my employees to think I'm perfect all the time. I want them to see my, you know, down. So I just want to leave you with a few words. One is, I really believe my next journey, my next decade is going to be dedicated to creating with a small group of people experience economy. I really believe we need to put a lot more value on experience than on products. That's what my journey is going to be on experience economy. And also we have to learn a new way of being elders, which is a two-way mentorship, not a one-way mentorship. So I just want to leave you with a story. I'm at uh, you know zero. So it's quickly a story of a man who carrying water in this thing with a stick with two pots on either side, taking from one place to the other. 
One pot makes it all the way to the end, the other pot keeps dropping all along. So the pots are talking to each other. This is a story, so you have to believe the pots are talking to each other. So one pot says to the other, you're so lucky, your water reaches the other end and feeds everybody. My water gets wasted all along and this guy is not doing anything about it. And the other pot tells her, you can't see it because you're on there, but the water dropping from you all along the way is germinating seeds, it's watering plants, and there's a whole forest being developed in the walk. The point is, some of us are these people who know exactly where we want to be, we are the CEOs, we are the whatever, make it all the way to the end. But others of us are the people who are making a change as we go along, and in this world, there's room for everyone. The key is to find out what your journey is all about. And the only way to manage chaos is to pull yourselves up from the grain of sand and see the beautiful patterns of sand dunes. Thank you. Thank you.